Welcome back, everyone. Today, we're going way back in time uh, to ancient China. We're diving into the world of oracle bone script, you know, that super early Chinese writing. And get this, we're going to look at some research that connects these ancient Chinese characters <laughs> to a civilization thousands of miles away. Oh, yeah? Yeah. To the Sumerians and their proto-cuneiform script. It sounds like something straight out of Indiana Jones, doesn't it? It's a pretty wild theory, and you're right. The implications are huge. I mean, if it turns out to be true, it could totally change how we think about how writing developed, wow. right? And how cultures interacted way back then. Right. Like, imagine. Yeah. These simple symbols could unlock a whole new chapter in human history. Exactly. Okay, but before we go too crazy, let's give everyone some context. For a long time, a lot of scholars thought that Oracle Bone Script, which popped up around the 13th to 10th century B.C., developed on its own in China, maybe evolving from symbols on pottery and things, but the research we're looking at today, it throws a big wrench in that idea. Definitely. Because proto-cuneiform, you know, the Sumerian writing system in Mesopotamia, it's centuries older than oracle bone script. It was mainly used for practical stuff, you know, keeping track of trade and resources. Okay. But this new research, well, it makes a strong case that there are direct links between specific symbols in both systems. So hold on. It's not just that they both had writing, but that there are, like, actual similarities. Between the symbols themselves? Yes. And not just a couple of the basic shapes. We're talking about tons of complex symbols with crazy similarities in form and meaning. Okay. Well, part of me is still a little skeptical. Couldn't some of these similarities just be like coincidence? After all, different cultures could come up with similar symbols for basic ideas, right? That's a good point. Huh. This paper, it uses a really cool analogy to explain why the sheer number of shared symbols and how complex they are. Well, it makes coincidence pretty unlikely. Think about winning the lottery. You know, matching a few numbers, that happens, but matching every single number, those odds are astronomically low. Ah, okay, I see what you're saying. So two cultures maybe could both invent a symbol, like an arrow for hunting, but coming up with dozens of basically identical symbols for all kinds of abstract concepts, yeah, the coincidence argument doesn't hold up there. Right, and this paper says that the chances of that happening randomly are like almost zero. It's way more likely that there was some kind of exchange, right? Like cultures sharing ideas that led to these shared symbols. Wow, this is already blowing my mind. So how do we even start to untangle this? Well, this paper goes deep, analyzing almost 50 character pairings. But for our deep dive, we'll focus on some of the most interesting ones. Let's start with the character Tian. In Oracle Bone Script, it can mean field or hunting. Okay, and how does the simple character connect to Sumerian writing? Well, in protocuniform, they had this grid-like symbol, UDU, for sheep or cattle. Now, stay with me here because it seems random. But think about the things people did in fields and while hunting. Animals were hunted for food and de traded in markets. And markets often happen in open fields. I see. So Tian maybe isn't just a plain old field. It could have a deeper meaning. Tied to hunting and trading livestock, right? Which means a more complex society than people thought. Exactly. And this connection to trade it suggests that early Chinese civilization might have been way more connected to the outside world than we originally thought. Wow, this is already changing how I picture ancient China. What other symbols have these hidden connections? Okay, let's look at Zen. It's usually translated as divination or virginity, but this paper links it to U-Z-U-D, the proto-cuneiform symbol for suckling you. Um, I'm going to need some help with that one. How does a suckling you relate to those concepts? It's pretty fascinating. If you think of a suckling you as a symbol of fertility and childbirth, right? Well, you can see how that meaning might have changed over time to become associated with female chastity in Chinese culture. So it's like this meaning rooted in agriculture left a mark on the language. And Chinese cultural values, too. That's yeah. crazy. It really shows how interconnected language, culture, and history are, right? and how seemingly unrelated ideas can actually share a common origin. Okay, I am hooked. Let's do another one. What about she, which means troop? Ooh, this is a good one. The proto-cuneiform symbol, ERIN2, for people troops, is a bow and arrow. A pretty obvious link to warfare, right? But here's the thing. Bows and arrows weren't even that common in the Shang Dynasty, the time of oracle bone script. So why use a bow and arrow to represent troops if other weapons were more common? That's the big question. Maybe the symbol wasn't just a literal weapon, but a symbol of warfare itself, possibly borrowed from a culture mm. where the bow and arrow was super important. This is like peeling back layers of history, revealing more and more complexity. All right, what's next on our list? Let's look at Shi, the character for To Learn Right. 
The paper links this back to the protocuniform symbol SAR, which is reeds growing on land. Reeds. How do reeds relate to learning and writing? In ancient Mesopotamia, they used reeds to write on clay tablets. So SAR represented both a garden and writing. It's kind of poetic when you think about it. So are we saying that the ancient Chinese learned to write on reeds from the Sumerians? It's definitely a possibility. Mm -hmm. And it really challenges us to rethink how Chinese writing developed. Maybe it wasn't so independent after all. This is fascinating. What other connections are hiding in these characters? Okay, let's go a little more abstract. She forgot deity. It's really interesting because both oracle bone script and protocuniform use a similar abstract symbol for divine power. Wait, even abstract ideas like divinity are represented similarly. That's hard to explain as just coincidence. It really is. It suggests that these two civilizations, so far apart, had a similar understanding of what divinity meant. Okay, my mind is officially blown. What else is there? Let's look at two simple ones. Fen and Ba, meaning divide and eight, respectively. Divide and eight. How do those connect to Sumerian writing? This is where the paper gets really interesting. It says that the symbol for eight actually started as representing separation or division. Then later on, they created the character for divide by adding a knife to the eight symbol to make it clearer. So eight was like a visual shortcut for dividing. Then they made it super obvious by adding a knife. Clever. Right. And this deeper meaning for divide helps us understand other characters too, like Zeng which shows sheep being divided for sacrifice. I love how these symbols are giving us a deeper understanding of ancient Chinese culture and beliefs. It's like solving a giant puzzle. It really is. And the more we explore these connections, the more we realize there's so much more to discover about our past. Okay, I'm totally hooked. What other symbols are we gonna decode in this ancient code cracking adventure? All right, let's tackle a character that's puzzled scholars for ages. It's another Tian. But not the one for fields. This one's usually interpreted as woven mat. Another teen. So there's more to it than meets the eye. Right. This paper links it to the proto cuneiform symbol AK, which means to do, to make, or to act. Hmm. So maybe this Tian isn't just a thing, but an action. That could change how we understand it in those old texts. Exactly. And this new meaning, it can help us unlock other characters that use this Tian, like finding a missing puzzle piece. You know. This is amazing. It's like we're cracking a secret code. What other secrets are hiding in these symbols? Okay, get ready for this one. This paper suggests that Oracle Bone Script might have actually borrowed the rebus principle from protocuneiform. The rebus principle? Remind me what that is again. A rebus is like a picture puzzle. You use pictures to represent words or sounds. Like mm -hmm. imagine a picture of a bee and a leaf to represent belief. Ah, right. So they're saying that ancient Chinese scribes might have learned this wordplay from the Sumerians. That's a big claim. Any proof? They do. They point to lie for come and nian for year. Both systems use a tree for year. That's pretty common. But get this, both also use a reed symbol, protocuniform's GI, for come or return. Ah, I see it. A reed, it grows back every year. So it kind of symbolizes the cycle of time, right? Coming and going. It's like a visual metaphor. Exactly. It shows that ancient writing wasn't just about recording stuff. It was about expressing deeper meaning in how people saw the world. Okay, this is just getting better and better. Are there any other examples of this rebus borrowing? Yep. The paper looks at chu for go out and ru for go into. When you compare them to their protocuniform versions, you see a simplification from complex outlines to more linear forms. Perfect for writing on oracle bones. So they streamlined it, making it easier to write. Makes sense. Right. And what's even more fascinating is that ru in protocuniform is a boomerang, symbolizing things like throwing, pouring or releasing. Wait, a boomerang? That's so specific. How does that connect to go into? Well, you got to think about it. Throwing a boomerang is letting something go, but it also comes back, right? So Ru originally might have meant a bunch of things related to movement, like pouring liquid into something, that kind of exchange. Exactly. And that helps us understand how Ru is used in all sorts of contexts in Oracle Bone Script, even ones that seem totally 